اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا ابي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين واصحابه المنتجبين ولعنه الله الدائمة على اعدائهم اجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمه الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم can we recite a salawat and try and come forward if possible a salawat بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the last few sessions we have been talking about wilaya and talking about wilaya as being that means for fashioning and refashioning the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of the growth property that we have within existence and as a result within human existence when we talk about wilaya just a point of clarification that wilaya is Allah's wilaya wilaya means authority in the broadest sense it means sainthood as well so it's both spiritual and temporal essentially wilaya can only be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is due to this understanding that we state well our scholars state that the prophets who acquire prophethood only do so through the caliber of their connectedness in sainthood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is wilaya wilaya therefore is that beautiful pulling force of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards his self now when certain souls complete their journey to Allah and they are commissioned to revert to the world they come back as wali and as guide so predominantly the right fundamentally and essentially the right of obedience servitude devotion is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we direct ourselves to Allah or even if we don't willfully direct ourselves to Allah Allah is inescapable so Allah is the wali and that is from amongst his supreme names when it comes to his relationship with his creatures that are humans secondarily this wilaya is for the prophets and the greatest example of this wilaya and the most complete representation of this wilaya is Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam he is the crowning glory of Allah's beauty in human form as far as the creatures are concerned to the best of our knowledge being confined to the earth the fullest most complete representation of the beauty light love glory splendor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finds itself in Muhammad Rasulullah where he is both the utmost authority when it comes to deen at the horizontal level and he is the utmost saint when it comes to the vertical level after Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam this wilaya aspect of sainthood and authority not in the sense of communicating to the creatures the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but in the sense of explicating that message and that saintly authority in the I'm going to use these words forgive me in the hierarchical spiritual scheme for the existence of the whole of existence is then in the hands of the awliya that are after Muhammad Rasulullah and these are the 12 imams and I don't think anybody in the Muslim schools of thought would at all 
have any problem in accepting this notion. So primarily and fundamentally, the wilaya is that of Allah. And that is why we say, our direction is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody else. Primarily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dictates the terms of growth and requires obedience, for obedience is the only means for the self-realization and completion. And that is why we have been stating that centrality is not there for prophethood or for anything else. Centrality is there for God and God alone. And the human is the full subject for the process of self-realization. If we were to understand it in this way, then we will know that the scheme of wilaya when it comes to the prophets and the imams is wholly within the ambit of the wilaya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah's wilaya finds secondarily an expression in the prophet and after the prophet in the 12 imams that have come after the prophet. These are the awliya Allah which enjoy both types of wilaya, the vertical and the horizontal. We, because we want to go towards the conclusion of what we have been saying in certain aspects, we stated that deen touches every aspect of human existence and addresses it in a very balanced way, in a very realistic way, in line with human nature. Human nature being what? Growing from weakness into strength in a very realistic, manageable way. That flow from weakness into strength has to be a directed flow, taking into account the state of weakness, addressing it, and then bringing completion to that state at any given rank of human progression. In that, naturally, we find what we call relativity, plurality both at an individual level, at the level of the horizontal coexistence of different communities, different tribes and different sects and different religions. All of these will grow at different rates. Deen, Deen will address them in accordance with their own given contexts, allow for plurality, individuality, and give them growth in accordance with their own strengths. Now, before we go any further, when the Prophet came to his community, they are described as people who had no trace of humanity. The Prophet merely picked on minute goodness that was there, realizing their state of weakness and the potential good that was there. He then addressed that little good that was there, amidst the great amount of weakness and allowed the goodness to flourish naturally and naturally brought out beautiful what we call multifaceted completion within the individuals in his community and the community at large bearing in mind in his divine mind that the community and the individual enjoy a reciprocal relationship. Now the deen, as we have been explaining, is something that has salient features. The rest of it can be fashioned and refashioned in accordance with the growth of the community, in accordance with their relativity. We stated that no came with sharia, thereby abrogating the sharia of Adam that was there. But Adam's Sharia was only effective because it allowed for unhindered, natural, beautiful, <coughs> calm flow and growth. Now, no cannot falter with that central pillar of what Adam was doing. So what did Nu do? He was mindful of the salient features. He only came and gave expression to those salient features in accordance with the demand of his own community. Ibrahim comes with his own Sharia 
abrogates new sharia but what does abrogation mean abrogation does not mean that he tore it away from the root uprooted it how can he he was mindful of the salient features of growth and his deen was refashioning those salient features in accordance with the complex demands that were created by the growing human community which was a pluralistic community in which we had nations that wished to interact so in all of that what was deen doing deen maintained its central pillars they are just like the child growing the central property is what one of growth one of fulfillment but when the child enters into a school you will teach them colors shapes one two three numerals letters a b c but as soon as the child grows beyond that stage a b c has now going to give way to word structures cat mat dog pig there is a reason why i caught dog and pig to this audience by the way salawat <laughs> i'm just trying to rid our hearts of this great enmity and animosity that we have for the pig that doesn't mean go and eat it if we love the pig we won't eat it okay and we should love the creatures of god then from single words the child has to progress into making sentences from sentences paragraphs from paragraphs novels can you not see that is the progressive trend always build on the growth acquisition or what we call self realization build on that this is exactly what deen has been doing it's no different than this nature that we have in that way we can see that two children are not the same in their progress two schools are not the same yet they are all progressing we can see natural relativity plurality individuality and amidst all there is beautiful unhindered growth of all this is exactly what deen has been doing the awliya of deen whether prophets or imams as we will go and explain today have always been fashioning and refashioning the salient features of deen what are the salient features of deen and this is the most important part they are liberation existence is always liberating itself in order to perform better in order to re- reveal itself at a more glorious stage a seed burst forth into what a little plant a plant breaks itself to culminate into what a small tree a tree bursts forth in its strength to reveal what its branches and gives fruits and what do those fruits do they continue with the same journey of evolution and growth so the salient feature is one of liberation the beauty of deen is that deen has understood how the human individual and community liberates itself not only in the horizontal scheme but also the vertical one in the vertical one direct yourselves to allah he is the point of utmost completion give yourselves away so you yield become the objective that you yourself have to reach but in the horizontal scheme what the deen does is it fashions the principle of liberty in the most beautiful way look at it the human community cannot survive save by the sacredness of life so the quran on the one hand speaks la ikraha fi din there is no coercion in din i e liberation factor the principle of all principles the mother of principle on the other hand the quran declares he who kills a soul it is as if he has killed mankind as a whole he who has killed a soul shall go to hell without any forgiveness killing a soul unjustly is akin to doing shirk with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where there is no liberation but con- total damnation speaking the truth allows for the growth of the community imagine 
These are the primary conditions and the primary morals and the secondary morals. And then at a later, day, at a later stage, communal morals. We, they are all built on the fundamental of liberation and growth. The fundamental condition is liberation. The moral scheme is built around the fundamental. Yes? If I can explain that. There is only one condition in existence and that is liberation and arriving at completion. The Deen is fashioning every single salient feature of it based on that fundamental of liberation. Do not kill anyone. If we were to kill each other, human life cannot be sustained. If we were to lie to each other, then I don't know if the Quran is the truth. You don't know if what I'm saying is the truth. The man made the announcement that today, 10.30, we will have this series of talks. We don't know if he's speaking the truth. Human life cannot exist. So there has to be that level of truth and trust. And that is a secondary moral in my personal scheme, this humble slave scheme. That's a secondary moral. And every moral is built on that scheme, on that scheme of liberation. What does Deen do? It gives the fundamentals of liberation. What do the prophets do? They come and they fashion and refashion the fundamentals in accordance with liberation so that individuals attain salvation. So now, the salient features of Deen are what? Submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Social justice fulfillment of human needs and that is why you see that when religions come they do not begin to preach a lofty spiritual metaphysical philosophical message without first seeing to the needs of human beings how on earth do i expect a person who is starving to death whose family have no food to eat to stand on the prayer mat and devote himself to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the first point is to feed them, to give them shelter, and then that philosophical inquiry will come within them. And that is why the Muslims, like the Christians, their brothers, have made a huge mistake. When they go out, the missionaries, they hand out Bibles, Quran, Najul Balaga, and Sayyafi Sajjadiyah. Are they going to eat the Sayyafi Sajjadiyah and the Bible and the Quran? Are they going to make a house out of Sayyafi Sajjadiyah? Give them their fundamental needs first. Feed them first. And that is how we see the law of Islam. Somebody has stolen. Why has he stolen? Because the state has kept him hungry. Cut the hands of the statesman, not cut the hands of the thief. He had no choice. And that is why in Islamic ethics and morality we are told that if a community is poor and they become godless, it's the fault of the rest of the community. Not that person's fault because Poverty makes immoral individuals and the people who are around are to be blamed. And that is why in our theology of society we have this and this beautiful ahadith in which Allah says, I was naked, did you clothe me? This theology. I was hungry, did you feed me? I was lost, did you direct me? The theology of the oppressed and those who are less fortunate. So what would deen do? The deen salient features are those that are in sync with the principle of liberty and growth. The deen liberates. The deen fulfills the fundamental needs in order to bring about that lofty salvation through self-realization. But at the secondary level, the deen, after valuing life, will go towards the fulfillment of intellectual needs and the growth of a greater human. So every individual by deen should be educated. And deen increases autonomy of individuals and their liberty. So actively the deen system, deen social political system, will give people liberty and autonomy. Representation within a political system a sort of state in which a person can have a say in determining their own destiny in accordance with this principle of salvation and liberty. This is what Deen does. Now when the Deen is refashioned by this great awliya in their presence, 
This refashioning does not leave any of the aspect of deen intact, no matter what it is. No matter what it is. It is here that we begin to understand the secrets of what was happening in the time of the Prophet and subsequent to the Prophet. And this will then give us an insight into how we ought to be at this present time in the absence of the 12th Imam, who is the wali of all awliya, the axis and the pole of existence and creation. Now, when Islam came and when the Prophet came, people have this very blurred sort of understanding, not even blurred understanding, very false understanding that he brought about the golden era. It's true he brought about the golden era, but not in the way that me and you have understood. He was forced to address the deen in the context in which he found his community. How can it be otherwise? The Prophet came and he spoke a language. What language was it? Arabic. Why did he speak Arabic? Because he was amidst people who spoke Arabic. Do you not see that? He was in the same context. Those words that the Prophet spoke had a history behind them. Every word had history behind them. He came and abided by cultures. What cultures? The cultures that were prevalent. What conventions? The conventions that were there before him. He addressed his deen in accordance with the norms, restrictions, context of the time in which he came and it could not have been otherwise. Otherwise it would not have worked. It's like saying the Prophet comes to the, I know it's a highly hypothetical situation, it may not even be accurate to give such an example. If the Prophet were to come here today in this context and say, despite the fact that the majority of the women in this part of the world are single, not, I won't say majority are single parents, but majority of the women in this part of the world are both carers and providers that they will get half of the share of the inheritance. It doesn't make sense. He would have to address this community in accordance with its own context and drive it towards an ideal situation. So if the ideal situation is, as one believes, that a woman should be a carer, because no one better than a woman to care, and a man should be a provider, then in that case, the woman is provided for at every level of her life, and it is fair that she gets half the share of inheritance. But in this part of the world, if the Prophet were to come, he would have to act in accordance with the context of this part of the world with the aim of driving it towards its completion. And that is what Deen does. The Deen is an overwhelming truth designed to bring humanity as humanity with its weakness and plurality to a stage of completion and self-realization and hence it has to address the situation in its own context. So now, if the Prophet had no choice but to address the Deen in accordance with the context of his own time, then the context starts changing immediately. It is here now that we are saying that the finality of deen and religion does not mean what we have understood, the finality of the system of deen that was there in the time of the Prophet, and it cannot change at all. Halal Muhammad, halal ila yawmil qiyamah is a hadith. I agree, and we are going to deal with it very, very shortly today, inshallah. It means only this, that the Prophet was supplying the means for actualization, self-realization, for growth in that context. But what is being failed, what has not been understood, is that there was no finality to that expression. He gave an expression of deen in the restriction of his context with an aim, with an aim that there is no finality to that expression, but finality is for that deen that allows growth in which there are salient features of growth and liberation, social justice, peace, harmony, so on and so forth. Now it is here, now it is here that people get extremely baffled and they feel that any talk of refashioning or talking about the refashioning of deen is heretical talk. Now I will say that yes, 
If it is frightening, I agree it is frightening. And if somebody does not agree with it, then it is their right not to agree with it. And if somebody has a counter argument, then please bring it forward so that we can all be enlightened. In our humble capacity, we need to open our minds and we need to discuss this. But the theology provided at that time, the morality provided at that time, the legal system provided at that time, the interrelationship of individual and community provided at that time, provided that they weren't constituting the salient features, can all change and be re-expressed and refashioned. Now you might ask, it's a strange thing that you are saying. What is the evidence for this? Look at the ample evidence that we have. In fact, I'm going to give a few of them today so that that will lead us into our tomorrow's talk properly. And in that, we have a lot of indication as to what needs to happen. The very fact, and we touched on it yesterday and we spoke about it in el el elaborately four years ago, the very fact that abrogation occurs within the Quran. On the one hand, the Muslim maintains Quran is eternal. On the other hand, he says the Quran has been cancelled. That doesn't make sense at all. Abrogation means one verse replaces another verse. But how does it replace it? When you are saying and maintaining that that verse is eternal, this verse is eternal, what has happened to the eternity of that verse in its meaning if it has been cancelled altogether? This says to us so evidently that the salient feature of the first verse now is being accommodated by the second verse. And the second verse is refashioning the first verse. Can you not see that? It is so obvious. The first verse has not become redundant. It is reactive in a relativistic situation. Like for example, if the wives don't yield, beat them. Yes? Right. You might get a time like there was in the time of the prophet where women were childlike. They were childlike because they were highly uneducated. They were treated as cattle. They did not have the sophistication of thinking nor understanding of morality or self-determinism. They were led by the male dominant society. So there, of course, a man will go and do this to reprimand a woman. But today, sophisticated community like this, would you ever do that or the Quran would ever condone that? But in fact, the people who've not, uh, who've not understood the world, they beat up their women black and blue. But I will say this, that you might have a case for the original verse in its original meaning in some remote village of Pakistan or Amazon where women are still kept in the same way and are not allowed to evolve and are just beginning to evolve. That in the literal sense, that verse might be valid in those regions where you go and slightly slap the risk to say, look, you're doing something wrong here. Is it at all possible to say that in this part of the world where women are academicians, doctors, prime ministers, members of parliament, that they can't accurately retain information? That if a woman tells me that this is what I have seen or what I have heard, that I would say, Mrs. Thatcher, for example, comes to me or Hillary Clinton, mind you, in Hillary Clinton's case, I would ask one other witness. <laughs> But if Mrs. Thatcher, if Mrs. Thatcher were to come to me, would I ever deny? In fact, if Dennis came to me, I would say, look, bring Mrs. Thatcher with you so that we can get verification for the whatever you're saying. You see, the Quran in its law as well says that let there be two female witnesses so that if one does not remember, the other one will remind her. The Quran itself points at the context that these women are not accustomed to retaining information accurately. Although I have a very different theory about women's psychology and male psychology, but we'll put that aside for now and not going to talk about it. But at this very at surface level, at face value, the Quran says in Surah Baqarah, when you are uh, making a will, if death comes upon you, then retain two men to bear witness. And if there's no two men, then one man, one man and two women. And then it explains that because if one female fails to remember, then the other one can remind her. It itself is giving you the context that they are unable to retain information in the accurate of manners because they're not accustomed to it. But men are. And if that evolution occurs within the woman mind, female mind, then obviously there's no sense in asking for another woman so long as we know she can retain that information. 
We see this again and again and again within the Quran that the salient feature of growth is being refashioned. Then again, look at the whole story of Qibla. The whole story of Qibla. It was changed from Mecca to Jerusalem to Mecca. It was accommodating growth of the Muslim community. Nothing else. Yes, there is value to Mecca and hence we are facing Mecca. But Allah should have known that more than anybody else that there is that value in Mecca. So why did he change it to Baytul Muqaddas? Of course, there are philosophical arguments. But I want us to just dwell on the surface level of this argument that abrogation occurs. It's fashioned, it's refashioned. Can you not see that? Similarly, look at the Muslim community from weakness to strength. Protect yourselves initially in Medina. Now, create your identity as the other. Now at a later date, give them protection and you are the predominant. Then at a later date, become pluralistic. The Jews, the Christians, the Sabians together with the Muslims will all attain salvation. Look at this flow from weakness to strength and Deen has been accommodating all of that. Or again, when the verses of alcohol came, they came so gradually, so gradually, in order to accommodate that growth properly, property, they were fashioning and refashioning themselves, giving themselves different expressions so that the community would arrive at a point of self-realization where they could control their habits of consumption of alcohol. And even after the outright ban, the revealed ban, yes, came upon alcohol, not any ban, the revealed ban from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the revealed prohibition came upon the consumption of alcohol. People went to the Prophet and they said, we still consume alcohol. The Prophet, if his understanding of Islam was as pedantic, as, as literalistic, as literal as mine and yours, he would have said, how dare you lash this man, wouldn't he? He said, okay, well, if you can't give up drinking, then what can you give up for me? And he tolerated that person. Look at the beautiful way he fashioned and refashioned his deen in the context of that single individual in order to allow that individual to grow in accordance with his own context and his own weakness. I'm not saying that the law should not have uniformity. Of course, law cannot work if it doesn't have uniformity. I can't say to the judge in the court when I've been done for speeding at 120 miles per hour that I can cope with such raging speeds. No, law does not work in that way. But here is the lawgiver himself and he is exercising his own discretion. And he is giving that individual the ability to progress in his own context. He is fashioning and refashioning the deen in accordance with its salient features. Now, look at the whole of this context of the fasting. I, as I said today, I will just going to give an evidence what we've been saying so far and bring out certain themes that are very uh, crucial with, you in, 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 with regard to this particular theme. Look at this example. And before we go there, I'll just clarify this, that the primary uh, feature of deen is the metaphysical one. By metaphysical, what it means is this growth and liberation. The secondary ones are the theological ones. Then there are the moral ones. And finally, it's the Islamic legal system that is designed to achieve those morals that are to be achieved in the growth process. So fiqh is the very last thing. And it's the one that is most open to fashioning and refashioning. Now, look at the verses of the fast. Allah says in Baqarah, Surah Baqarah, Kutiba alaykum usiyam kama kutiba ala ladina min qablakum la'allakum tattaqoon. Fasts have been prescribed for you as they were prescribed before you so that you become God mindful. Then, a few verses later, an odd thing, an odd thing, extraordinary thing happens. The fast that these people used to practice prior to Islam, that then became a norm within Islam, were fasts in which a man could not approach his wife for the duration of the fasting period. Not in the daytime when they are fasting, but for the whole month, let us say. Two, they could only have one meal per night. That too before they sleep. But if a person were to go home and fall asleep, then they forfeit their meal. Yes? Now, the youths were going to their wives in the month of Ramadan and committing a crime and a sin. 
Now, immediately the Quran should have revealed that I know what you are doing. And don't be disobedient to your own souls. Because through that you are forfeiting your own growth, spiritual growth and excellence. But what does Allah do? Look at this verse. It is halal for you to go to your women in the nights of Ramadan. I'm avoiding all of that. Then Allah says, Allah knew, Allah knows that you are being disloyal to your own selves. He has forgiven you ankum and wiped out every trace of that evil. Falan Bashiru Hunna, now go near them. As opposed to saying, How dare you do this when the command has come to you? Allah looks at them mercifully in the context of their own weakness and changes the law altogether. It's amazing. Later on in this verse, we are going to cite another part of this verse. What happened was that a man went to his house fell asleep, did not eat. The next day they were digging trenches for uh, defending themselves from the oncoming army. And a man fainted. The Prophet said, why has he fainted through fatigue? He was told that he forfeited his meal last night. He fell asleep before he ate. And since he fell asleep, the law is that you can't eat after you sleep. Allah, the Prophet felt sorrow for this man. Immediately Allah changes the law. Eat and drink as much as you want until the dawn. He immediately changes the law. There was a centrality. There was a central tenet, a principle to that particular fast. And that was to bring about a state of godliness. The rest of it was up for fashioning and refashioning. We see this example within the Quran. There are many, many examples. I'm just giving very selected examples that Allah does not hesitate to change things. First and foremost, it comes in a context. And then the Prophet refashions it. And Allah ordains that refashioning through the Quran. Look at taxation. Look at Khums, for example. The Khums has also a context. The Arab heads used to take a fourth of every income that their tribes used to have. To the extent that the poets lamented that you have this, you have that, you have this, and on top of that, you are fourth of whatever we earn, of whatever we uh, receive, of whatever comes to us. You have a right in the fourth. The Quran came and the fourth was reduced to a fifth, khums. Now, this khums, as Marhum Muntazari explains, and I find his deliberations on khums, to be most accurate. He states that the taxation of Homs was in the capacity, was for the Prophet in the capacity of a head of state. The zakat has always been there to fulfill the needs of the people, shelter, food. That is the function of zakat. I don't know why the Shia community has abandoned zakat as a welfare system that is being talked within the Quran again and again and again. In fact, in one of those verses that we will cite tomorrow, inshallah, zakat comes first and salah comes afterwards in priority, list of priority. But Homs was there as a tax levied by the state in the capacity of the state to look at the affairs of the state. And the portions that are given, I can't analyze the verse right now because it will take us way beyond our time. I just want to look at some features of it. It was there in the, in the capacity of a head of state taking state tax to govern state affairs, defense, schools, building of roads, education, so on and so forth. This was the function of Homs. Now, when it came to the time of Imam Ali, salamu please with that salwat come as far forward as possible. Uh. Now, Imam Ali, when it came to his time, he said, I pardon my share of khums. My Shia can consume it. When he said my Shia, he meant the Muslim, who's Muslims who believe in me and my wilaya can consume it wholesomely. The Imam was asked, he said, well, why don't you explain to your community that giving of the khums is an obligation. Do you know what the Imam said? 
and look at this beauty and the flexibility in deen. The Imam said, if I were to tell them that khums is wajib, and if I were to tell them praying nawafil in congregation is not halal, they would abandon Islam altogether. So Imam knew that there was something wrong. He still tolerated it. Why? In terms of the weakness and the context of his community in which he found himself. And that was as much a part of deen as anything else. That weakness-based tolerance. Then, when it came to Imam al-Baqir, he levied khums on items upon which khums is not to be levied. So people complained. The Imam said, I have pardoned you my share. I have pardoned you my share. And I have introduced homes on these newer items for this year in order to meet with the needs of the growing community. Look at his response. What was he doing? He was fashioning and refashioning a central salient point of growth. It was not until the time of the seventh Imam when he institutionalized Khums, as late as the seventh Imam. In order for what? In order for catering for the needs of the growing community. That is exactly what they have been doing. And in addition, they've all said Khums should not go out of your own locality. So on and so forth. And the function of Khums was to provide medical, uh, uh, to, pro to provide education, protection, and medical needs, so on and so forth. That is the function of homes. In this country, nobody is without shelter, nobody is without education, nobody is without food. We have seen so much creep into religion that was never a part of religion. And it's been ordained by religion. So here now, I do think that the community of the believers of Ibn Abi Talib should uphold the text like homes. They should all be giving zakat for those regions outside the UK that require assistance. But in addition, they should be giving homes for the upliftment of the community. But the exact amount of homes, how it should be levied and how it should be given should be fixed by the collective intellect. And homes, if it's seen as a responsibility, then it is the right of Allah and his prophet and the wali in their capacity as the heads of Muslim states. It should be an institution governed by business, commerce, minds that has full transparency and accountability. So it does not go to waste. I am of the firmest belief that if I were to waste this revenue of Allah or give it away someplace that has no accountability or do not know what they're doing, I will stand in front of Allah on the day of Qiyamah and the Prophet of Allah and I shall be answerable. That why did you waste this revenue that belonged to the Muslim Ummah as the Muslim Ummah or the Ummah of the Prophet and Ali ibn Abi Talib as the Ummah of the Prophet and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Why did you give it away when you knew that those people did not understand how to deal with financial matters? They were not qualified enough. And that is why I'm being saying that it is the collective intellect that needs to occupy the seat of the wali. Then again, in the time of the sixth imam, the law was that the girl becomes mature or at the age of nine, so she can marry off. And we explained this in one of the lectures, that it was abiding by the law and the context of their time. Islam always is human beings taking birth in the cradle of animality from where a human being grows. At the age of nine, it was a law of jungle. She's menstruating. She's capable of having children. Get her married off. But when it came to the sixth imam, because the conditions had changed, the things they were eating, drinking, the way they were transacting, they were no longer nomadic people. So the sixth imam said what? A girl becomes balig at the age of 13 or whenever she menstruates. There you go. He has refashioned it all together in terms of the growth of the community and of the individual. There are so many examples. I'm going to restrict myself to this. And there are two major points we need to finish. Now, somebody will say, Halal Muhammad halal ila yawm al qiyamah. Haram Muhammad haram ila yawm al qiyamah. The halal of Muhammad is halal till qiyamah. Haram of Muhammad is haram till qiyamah. I will say, granted. Because halal of Muhammad is in accordance with deen. 
and the salient features of deen. And haram of Muhammad is in accordance with deen. I will say, if you are beating your chest with this narration, then ask Imam Sadiq, why did he declare that the girl becomes balig at the age of 13 as opposed to 9? Why did he say that? Did he not understand halal Muhammad, halal illa yawm al qiyamah? Ask him. When you say this, ask Imam Sadiq, why did he allow the meat of Qurbani from Mina to be removed from Mina when he himself said my grandfathers Muhammad and Ali were not allowing it? But now I see there is so much meat within Mina, it's going to waste, take it out of Mina. Did he not understand it more than me and you, the meaning of this hadith? So here we ask a fundamental question when you quote any hadith or any law or any moral that has been delivered by the Prophet or the Quran or Ali ibn Abi Talib, two questions need to be asked. What does it mean? And why was it brought? It has a meaning to it. Have you understood it carefully? And what purpose was it serving? Have you understand, understood that properly? This is where the secret lies in our modern endeavor through the collective intellect to bring about that glorious state of Islam that promotes at most growth. I'll give a very mundane example. For the majority of the years that I've lived in this community, on the 29th of Ramadan, I have gone out 28 miles to have a cigarette and a cup of tea. Honestly, how foolish have I been? Imagine. In, at times, Mark's 7 series, and this is true, factual. At times, in, and I forget the names of these, you know, high-end cars, unless I buy one, I won't remember it. Nice Lexuses, BMs, and some of the people who are here were smiling now with big grins because they used to take me out and come with me. I ask myself today, is this travel that the Prophet was talking about? The Prophet said travel and it is due to the fatigue encountered through travel that Allah gives you sadaqah and don't refuse Allah's sadaqah, eat and drink and break your prayers. I go in my Bentley and mark all the fatigue that I have. I'm relieved of the fatigue after 28 miles. We are talking and listening and having a chat. Oh, is it already 28 miles? Let's just go to London instead. You feel comfortable and then we go and have sips of tea. Is that really what the law meant? Genuinely, is this really what the law meant? This is what we are trying to explain. What does it mean and why? What does khums mean and why did it come? What does zakat mean and why did it come? Just because our community does not have cows and sheep and dogs and wheat and dates does not mean there is no zakat. Think and think again. And that is why we are saying the collective intellect now needs to occupy the seat of the wali. I will say this much without explaining it because there's no time. There is nothing but that it will go, undergo evolution in the growth process. The salah, the siyam, everything. Now we are on dangerous territory here. You are saying that I'm saying this, that everything goes through evolution. Then is there any basis? Yes, there is a hard and fast rule that this humble slave advocates, that anything that is not in conflict with the absolute condition of growth should be upheld. The Prophet prayed towards the Qibla, prayed towards the Qibla. He did ruku, he did sajda, do it. However, the prayer itself has an essence and has a fashion. The fashion of the prayer has to be maintained whilst we are in the capacity of maintaining it. But if somebody becomes airborne, goes into space, they will not do ruku, nor do sajda, nor do wudu. Can you imagine you're trying to put water in your mouth in deep space? My goodness, you'd, you wouldn't have air to breathe, right? I mean, the, the water would go up. You can't breathe it. Try to do ruku, you'll be somersaulting in air. But it doesn't mean that the essence of prayer is not obligatory. The essence of prayer is obligatory, that meditation. As opposed to the modernist school that is saying that the prayer is only meditation. 
I am saying no, it is ruku and sujood and all these things when you're in the capacity. And as opposed to the traditional camp that says that as soon as you're airborne, there is no prayer because there's no tahara, there is no ruku and there's no sajda. There's no rising sun, there's no setting sun. I'm saying no, there's an essence to deen and there is a fashion to deen, an expression to deen. If one expression is lost, the salient feature which is the essence is still intact. But on the other hand, you get this law or this sort of morality that an apostate should be put to death. This is sheer nonsense and nonsensical. On the one hand, the fundamental principle is liberation and growth. On the other hand, if anybody is using their free mind and their spirit, you're going to put them to death? This is sheer nonsense. And that's why we will say that the deen has an essence, the deen has an expression, and it is the collective mind now that has to discern. And the interpretation of the text itself is inaccurate, but we don't have the time to discuss that and how to discuss the parameters of his interpretation and how it needs to be appreciated. With that, we will finish this particular talk. We stated that the most brilliant aspect of deen is the vertical wilaya. The wilaya that relieves me of my ego and egocentricity. The wilaya that allows me to give myself away. By Allah, when the Sufis say, and when that hadith says, he who sheds a tear for Hussein, paradise becomes incumbent. This is a true hadith. It is a true hadith. You will find people who pray 100 rakats and after 100 rakats lose every sense of decency that they had before praying the 100 rakats through fatigue. You will find people who fast and read the Quran and memorize it unhesitatingly will advocate the killing of other Muslims and other human beings. You will find people who are the best of Muslims in their beards, in their attire who will not care less for the hungry stomachs of their neighbors. But when you observe somebody crying for Hussein, at that moment tell them, give me all that you possess in the name of Hussein, they will unhesitatingly give it all away. This is that wilaya. You ask a mother at the point when she's lamenting for Hussein, Shall you give your child for this love of your heart, Hussein? At that point, she will be ready to give him away. At other points, she will be ready to kill and die. This is how powerful the aspect of wilaya truly is. It would be a great shame if today's youths were to lose this finer touch of wilaya. The entirety of the beauty of human existence is in the loving of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad in the love of prophets of Allah but particularly the prophet of Allah and the children of the prophet of Allah and the brother of the prophet of Allah and the daughter of the prophet of Allah this then is the essence of wilaya and Hussein has created such a story that helplessly takes our hearts minds and souls alike I do not know how an old father would feel giving a son like Akbar to the arrows and to the swords. But I can say this much, that it was not easy for Hussein. And had he lost his life with Akbar, it would have been something that we would have understood. Who was Akbar and what was Akbar? When Ibrahim placed the knife upon the neck of Ismail, Hajra got news, she ran. She said, no, he could not have done such a thing. But she observed a slight mark on the neck of Ismail. She fainted through the thought that what if Allah had not intervened in time? What if Ismail had been slaughtered? Within four to seven days, she lost her life in that grief. It is Syria. The women have gathered 
they are allowed to lament on their Hussein and on their dear ones. The Maqatil speak that the heads are being brought in. When the head of Hussein comes, Zainab receives it. When the head of Abbas comes, Umm Kulthum receives it. When the head of Akbar comes, the women of Sham cry out and they say, O oh Allah, allow not his mother to be alive on this day to witness this scene. Such was Akbar. The poetry attributed to Hussein ibn Ali's mental state after the death of Hussein Akbar was this. O oh child, how short-lived was your life. Like the star that appears at dawn, that quickly fades away in the light of the sun. O oh moon, how quickly you are eclipsed, which seized you from becoming a full moon. O oh Akbar, when I speak, you are the name that appears upon my tongue. And when I am silent, it is you that preoccupies my soul. This is Akbar, such a caliber we find on the night of Ashura, these narrations that we'll narrate tomorrow. Akbar says to Abbas, O oh, uncle, do not go for the warfare before me, for my father's resolve shall break with your death. And Abbas says, O oh, Akbar, O oh, child, do not die before me, for my brother shall lose the will to live after you. Akbar. And what is Akbar? <clears throat> en route to Karbala, Hussein sleeps momentarily, awakens abruptly, and cries out, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Akbar says, Oh Father, we are Allah's, and we do return to Allah. But what brings these words to your mouth at this point, O oh child? I heard a call from the heavens which stated, O oh caravan, Hasten towards your death. He said, O oh father, are we not upon the truth? Who said, said indeed, O oh child. He said, O oh father, it makes little difference therefore whether we hasten within the embrace of death or death hastens to us. Such is Akbar. It is the day of Ashura when Hussein's companions have died. The renowned warriors of his family remain. Hussein's state of dignity would not allow him to let any of his brothers or sons or nephews go to the battlefield before his own most beloved Akbar. I don't know how he said to Akbar, Akbar, go and take permission of your aunts and your mother. We find in the maktal that the cloth of the tent lifted eight times and fell eight times. When he went and bade them farewell, they were falling at his feet. This was not an ordinary man. This was the embodiment of beauty, a personality that reminded them of the Prophet himself. Zainab would embrace him as would Umm Layla as would his sisters and aunts. They hesitated to let him go, and he declared, I cannot see my father in this state. O oh, mother, O oh, aunt, O oh, sisters, O oh, women of the household of the Prophet, would you not rather I gave my life for my father? Go, O oh, Akbar, go. It is here that we begin to realize the pain in the heart of his mother. Hamid ibn Muslim says that I saw Akbar ascend upon the back of his steed. Hussein raised his hands, his two fingers towards the heavens and said, O oh Allah, bear witness upon these people. Hamid ibn Muslim said, I saw him and heard him cry as a mother would cry upon the dead body of her youthful child. He looked at Akbar from head to toe and he said, O oh Allah, I now send to them a boy, a youth, that most resembles your prophet. In his features, in his speech, in his mannerism. O oh Allah, when we become desirous of your prophet, we glance at this Akbar of mine. Akbar is covered in armor. 
Akbar kisses his father on the forehead. He says, Akbar, leave. Go to the battlefield. Receive your grandfather. Go, Akbar. Akbar is going. But Akbar hears something behind him. When he looks behind, he sees Hussein clasping his chest and running behind Akbar and falling. <coughs> Akbar stops and says, Oh, father, have you not commanded me to go? Child, go. Then why do I see this? He said, Oh, Akbar, had you an Akbar like I have, you would not ask such a question. Akbar left for the battlefield. The law of the battlefield was this, that it would be single combat. They broke the law. They surrounded Akbar and fought with him altogether. Akbar killed over a hundred people. When Akbar was fighting, Hussein's heart was paining. Layla would come out and say, oh, master, any news of my child? He summoned Layla. He said, oh, Layla. Pray for your son and my son to return to us. He said, Oh, Master, how should I pray? He said, Speak to Allah and say, Oh, Lord of Yaqub, who caused Yusuf to return to Yaqub, bring my Akbar back to his Hussein. No sooner had Layla, Umm Layla, made this dua, Akbar appeared. He said, Oh, Father, the thirst kills me to no end. Is there a drop of water you can quench me with? I may fight your enemies once again. A father is being asked for a drop of water. Hussein looks at Akbar. He says, Akbar, take my tongue into your mouth. You might find some relief from your thirst. Akbar retracts and says, oh, father, your tongue is drier than mine. Akbar, take off your armor. It will offer some relief to you and place my ring into your mouth. The coolness of it may sustain you. Akbar now without hope of life, without his coat of mail, returns to the battlefield. Akbar engages with the enemy. Munka says to his companion, By Allah, I shall place such a wound in the chest of this youth by which his father's life will be taken away. His companion says, let him be. Those around him will put him to death. What cause do you have? He says, I have sworn by Allah to do this. Akbar fights somebody from behind a tree, strikes at Akbar's head. When he strikes at Akbar's head, Akbar can no longer maintain himself upon the saddle of his steed. The Maktal says, Akbar placed his head on the mane of the horse and wrapped his hands around the neck of the horse. The Maktal speaks, the horse was frightened and it rode straight into the enemy. And the Maktal cries out, erban erba. They hacked him into pieces. Akbar would not loosen his grip. Munkad came and struck Akbar as he was falling. The spear was struck in deep into the chest of Akbar. And as he tried to lift Akbar with his spear, the spear broke. Akbar falls upon the ground of Karbala and calls out, Wa Abata, alayka minni salam. O oh, Father, accept my salutations. We find this. Hussein falls. He cries, O oh, Akbar, call on to me so that I may come to you. He is calling out, Wa Aliya, Wa Aliya, standing and falling. When Hussein finally reaches the body of Akbar, he finds a woman stuck to the body of Akbar, the blood-torn body of Akbar. He is distracted from Akbar. He says, O maid of God, who may you be who wails upon my child as a mother wails upon her own? She turned to him and said, O brother, it is I, your Zainab. <laughs> Sheikh Abbas Kummi says, Zainab knew that the wound in Akbar's chest would kill Hussein. Hussein takes her by the arm and says, Zainab, return to the tents. Hussein comes at the feet of Akbar. Akbar is rubbing his heels upon the grounds of Karbala. This is the description we find. Hussein takes off his helmet, puts dust upon his head, cups Akbar's blood and wipes it on his face and says, Wa Akbara. 
O Akbar, the world has become a darkened place for me after you. Akbar breaks into a smile, O oh, Father, I see your grandfather here, quenching me from the chalice of Kausar, after which there is no thirst. He says, O oh, child, you have rested from the pains of this world, but you have left a wound in your old father's heart. Hussein places, I mean, the Muslim narrates, his face upon the blood-torn body of Akbar. We find this in popular narration. Akbar is grabbing his chest. Hussein says, O oh child, remove your arms so that I may feel your chest fully. He says, Father, I beseech you not to ask me to do such a thing. Hussein says, O oh Akbar, remove them. Yes, Hussein, Akbar removes his arms. Hussein sees the spear embedded deep within the chest and heart of Akbar. Hussein cries out, O oh, Ibrahim, come and see how your Ismail is being given on the plains of Karbala. <laughs> Hussein returns to the tents carrying the body of Akbar. We find these two narrations. Hamid ibn the Muslim says, A woman came out of the tent running. She says, Oh, Master, my child, my child, what has happened to my child? Hussein leaves the body of Akbar and escorts her back into the tent. I ask, who was she? And I was told, this is the mother of Akbar. After that, a lady comes forth and she says, Wa Akbar! Ah! Oh, Hussein, has my Akbar been killed? I asked, who was this? And I was told, this is Zainab. She fell on the body of Akbar and began to cry in a way that the heavens began to shake. Then I found a little girl and she said, Oh, Father, do you have any news of my brother? Your brother has been slain, oh child, and here is his body. She lamented and Hussein said, Oh, child, bear it with patience. She said, Oh, Father, how can one whose brother has been cut into pieces, whose father has been left without a son, bear with patience? Hussein cried out, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Hussein. 